So let me introduce myself. I'm a master's student. I study ICT and business in Leiden. I've been involved with several FLOS communities over the past 10 years. And I formerly worked as a software developer. The research that I'm doing for my degree focuses on open source communities. And rather than looking at smaller communities who consist entirely of volunteers, I am specifically looking at larger communities where you get volunteers, paid people, maybe a few companies involved. Now, I'm going to start by giving you a quick introduction to research that's been done on open source, uh, on open source uh, software development. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that I've noticed when I talk to people from my research. And I hope that I can give the people who are in these more complicated communities a few guidelines of things to think about when you pay people and what the effects of that are on your community, on your project's ecosystem as a whole. So we've had about 10 to 15 years of research in open source communities. And the people that are researching this come from a, come from a quite a large background, uh, quite a, a very academic background. We've got econom uh, economists in there. Uh, we've got people interested in software engineering in there. Uh, people from social sciences who are trying to figure out how we do things. Um, legal people and just the very basics, which kinds of applications are we making? Now, I'm interested in how we develop the software, not the technical specifics of it, but how do the people interact with each other? What is motivating people to do this? And this is a little bit more detail about the papers that are published, the, the kinds of scientific and scholarly interest that there is in our communities. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of interest in motivation. Now, motivation focuses on why we create this open source software. Because open source developers are a little bit weird for economists. We have a very good skill set. We can make a lot of money with the skills we have. And very often we do. But for some bizarre reason, we contribute all of this time and energy, often for free, to these random projects we're all working on. And the conclusion, because they spent about five years debating this, in the end they concluded, well, there's a lot of extrinsic motivation. And from the previous speaker, briefly talked about having your name in the commit log for the project. That's an example of extrinsic motivation. Another very typical example is if you're getting paid. I don't know if anybody here is getting paid to develop open source software. Quite a few, pe quite a few people. Um, if you go look at research, it's something between 16 and 40% of all the people working on open source that are being paid to do it. Now, next to this extrinsic motivation, which economists think that we, that is the core thing that motivates all of us, which is why they want to pay us for our jobs, apparently we have a lot of intrinsic motivation. We just really, really like what we're doing. We feel good when we write source code, we feel good when we give it to other people. And on top of that, because we are not black and white people, we've managed to internalize some extrinsic motiva motivation. This would be things like, I contribute back to the project that I'm working on because I use their code. I should be doing it. Now, this is still very black and white. We've introduced a small shade of gray. Um, so afterwards, a lot of other research has been done that looks at the, small, the smaller detriments of why we do what we do. And then people go and look at what's the effect of the license type? What's the effect of the size of the community? 
what's the effect of the people that are known to the community's founders. If you start a project, you draw in your friends first and they draw in some other friends. How does, how does that shape your community? But a little bit of a problem is that we've always looked, in research, we've always looked at individual developers. And any change, we look at, okay, we've changed this thing, now, do we get more developers, less developers? But it's always focused on one specific developer. I've, include, I've included some, ref, some references. Um, at the end, there's a URL where you can find a lot more references if you want to read up on all of this stuff yourself. So we know that we can, that we have nice, very intrinsically motivated developers who are willing to do a lot of stuff for us in their, f in their free time. But at some point, that developer also needs to eat. He might graduate from, high from university and he needs to get a real job. The bills still have to be paid. Now, traditional thinking is that when you start paying people, you remove their intrinsic motivation. Surprisingly enough, for open source, that doesn't hold. Somebody went in and did the research and concluded that if you pay open source people, they are still equally intrinsically motivated, but they get a little bit more motiva motivation because of the money you're spending on them. But as I already said, that's one individual developer. So if you're the lucky community that has a lot of money, or if you're a company and you want, open so you want volunteers to work on your open source project, what kind of stuff do you want to pay for? This is one of the things I ask people in interviews. If it's your choice, what kind of work do you pay for? And people were pretty much in agreement with each other. And they talked about how they pay for things that you can't do as a volunteer because the time involvement it, it requires is too long or because the work is too complex. They talk about wanting to pay for work that volunteers don't want to do. It's boring work. A lot of QA is, to a lot of people, very boring. Bugs that are not very common don't get fixed. You might want to pay for that. Some people talk about wanting to pay for skills that are not available in the community. If you have a financial package and you need to add very specific accounting practices, you want to talk to an accountant and try to get him involved as, an engineer, as, a, sorry, as a volunteer, but being an economist, he might not be that interested in that. A fourth thing you want to pay for is, time is work that is time critical or work that needs to be done in a certain way. A typical example would be keeping servers running 24-7. And why paying, paying for this work does not make somebody better at it, but it's in general a little bit easier to fix it if it goes wrong. And the biggest surprise that I got when I asked people what would you pay for is that people say you need to pay for community management. You need to make sure that it's somebody's task to keep everybody happy and involved and productive. There's a few different ways that you can pay people. You can just hire people. Here's a Here's a contract, 40 hours per week, no end date on the contract. You can hire people for specific jobs. One of the most well-known examples of this would be Google Summer of Code, where, in this case, students get money for spending a few months on a particular project that they agree on with the community they're going to work for. But you can also just say, 
I'm, contra I'm contracting out a rewrite of the UI of our program. You can have bounty systems where you say, for this job, so much money, $200, nah, say $2,000 is available for a particular feature you want implemented. One of the nice things about bounty systems is that everybody else can add more money to the pile and everybody sort of has an easy input in what's important to do. Or you can, your, or you can spend your money in a very different way and rather than directly paying people, you can reward them by paying their travel to a conference. Or by inviting them over, if you're a company, for instance, and there's a volunteer in the community around your product who's very well versed in a particular topic, you can invite that person over to come and explain it to your engineers. So now that we know what to pay for, and how we can work out this payment, who are we going to pay? On the one hand, you can pay the existing volunteers. It's a solution if you need more time from your people, but that's not really going to work if you need a specific expertise that's currently not available. So you can bring in outsiders. Outsiders are not well versed in the communities and sometimes forget they're newbies. Before I said that open source developers, if you give them money, they get, more mod get, they get more motivated. It's still a big question whether that holds true at a community level. Whether if I give developer John a monthly salary, will developer Mike still be interested in doing anything? What happens if I give Susan a six-month contract to rewrite the UI? Will Jane still be interested in doing anything else? And that's where my research is focused. So volunteers versus paid staff. They don't always work well together. Sometimes they work very well together. There's a few things that you should probably keep in mind. and I going to go over these. First of all, how accessible is your project really? I think almost all open source projects use a version control system. Is there anybody here who does not? How long does it take to get access to your version control system for a new developer? A day, a week, a month? How long does it take when that new developer is an employee? It usually takes about a day in that case. Otherwise, you're wasting money. But let's assume that it's very easy to get access to your repository. Is all the code in the repository? Companies that want to have a community around our project aren't always as quick to update the external facing repository as they could be. So you end up with volunteers working on things that have already been fixed. Not a great way to motivate people. How hard is it to understand your code? Where is the document that describes the architecture of the code? Is that something that's publicly available? Is that hidden in the source code? Or is that something that only lives inside your organization? How transparent is your software development? How are you making your decisions? Is it somebody? at the highest level of the company that decides these are the features we need? Or is it the engineers that decide this? Do volunteers developers get, do volunteer developers get a say 
in the decisions that are made, in the priorities that are, in, in the list of priorities for the project. If you're having a meeting to talk about anything related to the project, is that meeting open to people that are not employees? And if that meeting is open to people that are not employees, are you doing it at a time that non-employees can join you in your meeting? Because a meeting during business hours is hard to attend if you're not paid to do it. These are, two, these are the two biggest things that came out of my research so far. And they seem, to be they seem to be underlied by another thing. None of these things is caused by paying money directly. But when you pay people, you are entering into a different kind of contract with them. Volunteers work on things they want. They work on things when they want to work on them. And they tend to not have a lot of deadlines associated with that work. It needs to be fun. Usually volunteers already have a boring job next to it, and they don't want another boring job. Volunteers form social ties based on being on IRC, being on mailing lists, going to conferences such as this. Employees, on the other hand, get assigned work, they get deadlines. If they, if they go to a common office, they share office space, they often talk to their colleagues in the hallway. It's a discussion that's not written down, but that makes a lot of outsiders, that makes a lot of non-employees feel like outsiders in the process. At the same time, the deadline that the employee gets means he needs to get this thing done. And if he gets volunteers to help with that thing, at first you'd think, oh great, I have less work to do. But the reality is often that your volunteer does stuff. And for some reason, he cannot do a certain piece. And you have no way to go and be annoyed and force this volunteer to do this for you. So you often get, you often get the paid developers talking to each other rather than talking with the, with the volunteers. Because the volunteers are annoying, they want to be involved, they want to do this part, but they don't work to the deadline you got as an employee. And this is made worse by the fact that you have so many other ways to create ties to the people you work with. You go to dinner with them, you go to their birthdays, you see them every day. So let's go back briefly to how you pay people. You want to hire people. How do you decide who gets hired? Do you just pick the person who contributes the most? Do you pick the person who, gets, who contributes the best quality material? Do you pick the people in India where you can hire five for the price that you'd pay for one person in Silicon Valley? How do you motivate the volunteers that are not hired? How do you keep from becoming a project where you hire so many people that you cannot get volunteers anymore? Because if you hire too many people, people will join your project with the intention of getting hired. And if after three to six months, they have not yet gotten hired, they assume they're not good enough and they'll often leave. So fine, don't hire in long-term contracts because it creates problems. We'll get a short-term contract. We need to get a UI overhaul. We'll hire somebody for the UI overhaul. The work gets done. But as an organization, you have the problem that a month, sorry, that a year from now, when the work needs to be adapted because something changed, the person who did the work is gone. 
and you have to hire somebody else to do it again. If you hire for specific jobs, you can also create a culture where people expect to be paid for specific work. A good example of this is that in many open source communities, internationalization is not something that's paid for. The company might be paying for every other part of software development except for localization. And that's perfectly fine. The people in localization don't expect to be hired. But everybody else does expect to be hired at some point. The last category, if you want to use the rewar a reward system, because you don't want to hire people because of the results that have, it's, gr it's great for your community, but you're still not going to get the speed or the reliability that you would get from an employee because you're rewarding people for the time spent. Ra rather than setting them in a contract where you have to do a certain amount of work. The final thing, well, the thing I want to conclude with is that I s have the impression from the interviews I've done that if your company is a company where every engineer can influence the final product, you stand a good chance of being able to work with a community of volunteers around your product. If, on the other hand, your company is one where decisions get made top-down, you're going to run into a lot of problems with your volunteers. If you want to read up more on the science behind, it, behind this, you can find a lot of papers on Floss Planet. You can also find a lot of things on, on Google Scholar. My list of papers is also <laughs> available online. And when I finish up my research, I'm supposed to write a 50 to 100 page small book from it. If you want that, feel free to contact me by email and I'll send you a copy in two to three months. Any questions? <laughs> Can you name some of the projects you've worked with in your research? Sort of what sort of projects were they, or is that confidential? Um, the, the, the actual projects are confidential. Um, hmm? Yeah. Uh, but I've worked with project which had a large organization involved in that community. Um, it was not always the only um, organization with money involved, but it was usually one really big sponsor. And that could have been, but that could have been um, a commercial company or a nonprofit. Anybody else? <laughs> um, <clears throat> sorry. Did you see a lot of difference between nonprofits and paid uh, companies as far as like were volunteers more willing to stay as volunteers alongside paid nonprofits? Okay. That, so. Sorry. I know. Um, so the question is whether I saw a lot of difference between uh, for-profit companies and non-profit uh, organizations in this field. Um, I did not see a difference between the two. Or maybe a better way to say it is that the differences that I've, I've seen in published papers, because I'm not the only one who's looked at this, sure. um, and in the communities that I've interviewed people from, does not lead me to draw the conclusion that it's non-profit or for-profit, that that's the cause of the differences. Cool, okay, thanks. Just 
some comment that uh, it looks to me like uh, some old style, old style free software uh, look for the commercial companies as I work for major GNU Linux vendor and everything is done upstream. All the decisions are done by the global maintainers of the free software and uh, the company developers are really, really contributors of the free software project. So it is driven by the free software upstream. So there are no decisions hidden in the company. Can so you phrase that a little bit different? Because I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. Uh, I'm not asking. Uh, I was just uh, commenting that uh, uh, I work for uh, free soft, uh, GNU Linux vendor. And uh, the decisions are done in the upstream projects, like uh, the compilers, GDB. GCC, and it is not driven from inside of the company as if the decision upstream is done some way, the company cannot do anything with it. So it's not, the decisions are not hidden in the company. The uh, company is really a contributor to the GNU yeah. project. You're talk the company you work for uses the code of, a, of, an, uh, of an open source project, but it's not driving that project. Did I get that correct? It is major contributor, but uh, we can't change anything. If Richard Stallman says something, nobody can yeah. change it. So. <laughs> That's a slightly different case than the organizations I looked at, indeed. And that will, that will prevent some of the issues I saw, I think, as long as that company does not become the dominant player in that project's ecosystem. Yes. Uh, I want to know, uh, after the, the paid uh, motivation, uh, what the, what's the based motivation possible? Is it uh, the notoriety of the leader, of the, the code leader? Is it uh, the, uh, the, the fun of the community? the uh, uh, travel or uh, personal uh, uh, use of the, of the program or uh, 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 work on a program for a non-profit uh, organization? What, what's the best? Uh, you, you want to know the motivations of people that are being paid? Uh, so the, the motivation for the people who are not paid. The ones who are not paid. Um, some of that is the same as in open source communities where you don't have companies involved. Namely, it's fun doing it. I'm learning interesting things from it. I know people on the project and I'm having, they drag me in and motivate me. Um, but what I noticed is that several of the people I interviewed for a particular project explicitly mentioned that they wanted to get hired. They were contributing, and they were contributing a lot, but they really wanted to get hired, and they, not all of them were sure that they would stay with the project if they did not get hired. Okay. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, a lot uh, what you said here, and a lot of the questions you, you posed are uh, similar to what can be read on the wiki patterns. Uh, I don't know if you know that. Uh, there is a, a web page about introducing wikis into your, corp uh, your uh, I don't know. I think I have firm. that book. I think there's a book about this as well. Yeah, I, I have it. what I wanted to ask is, uh, do you also look at the wiki communities? Because they seem to be much uh, better uh, researched. Than, than the open source communities, and they seem to have similar patterns of, of how they work. Um, I haven't looked at editing communities uh, on wikis. There is a lot of research on them being done, but I'm not sure how much research is being done on them. I, I, by now I know exactly how many, well, not exactly, but I know pretty, pretty well how many papers have been written about open source communities but not about wiki communities. I see. Thank you. How many different communities did you study in this process, and what was the range and size of the community? I studied one community in depth, 
and I talked to people from two other communities to compare whether what I saw in the in-depth interviews matched what they experienced in their communities. And how big were those communities? Um, Just a rough ballpark. I mean, like 10 people, thousands of people. No, between 10 to 50, 10 to 100 developers. I don't know exactly anymore. I need to go look it up. Okay, thank you. Do you think there's a difference between um, developing work and maybe more like sysadmin work, modera list moderation, and all this kind of maintenance? Um, do you, I think you're talking about two different things. List moderation and sysadmin are, I suspect, two different categories of work. One is the community management stuff, which a lot of open source projects seems, seem to let fall the, by the wayside easily, which is also why several people mentioned, pay for this. It's important. Um, more sysadmin stuff. Is, it's less glorious to do sysadmin, and you, have, and you often have to do the 24-7. So I see that there can be more issues with it in that regard. But I haven't studied the two separately. So I can't say if it's really scientifically proven whether they're the same or not. Anybody else? <laughs> Thank you.